Thank you. Um, welcome to the 2020 PEMNA online plenary conference um, TCOP session. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to remind you to please mute when you are not speaking. And also, if you have something to say, um, please use the chat feature or the raise hand feature in WebEx. And um, the moderator for um, today's session is Mr. Fabian Sudera, the PEMNA TCOP facilitator and also the lead public sector specialist from the World Bank. Fabian, over to you. Thank you, Gina. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to reconnect, even if it's virtually, um, and uh, unlike the memorable uh, TCOP we had in Moscow. And uh, actually, I would like to uh, thank and uh, welcome also Marina, who has joined us at 4 a.m. from Moscow uh, today. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, all the TCOP members and the many volunteers for the presentations. It really shows how vibrant this community is. It, will also, it also shows that we'll have to do a tight time management, so please bear with us uh, if we send you reminders uh, before the, the time is, uh, just before the time is up. We have uh, very dense and substantive sessions, uh, two sessions today, with three presentations each, country updates, and we really want to also keep some time for discussion and ex exchange. Uh, so the, a new feature in, in this uh, PEMNA plenary and also TCOP is the recording of the session, as was mentioned yesterday. We want to give you a, he a heads up, but also to reassure you that the Secretary will not post uh, the recording, the video, on his website unless we receive the consent of all the participants and unless they Photoshop my gray hair, so we have a, an agreement. So if there are any other spe special requests, uh, please let us know. Uh, but it's really part of uh, a communication attempt and to a knowledge sharing attempt. So let me start with a quick reca <coughs> sorry, recap of uh, yesterday. So we had very rich plenary sessions yesterday. Uh, of which I took away six main points. One is really the unprecedented fiscal response to an unprecedented crisis um, with a stimulus going from 1% to 7% GDP, so that this definitely has an impact on public finances. It has an impact on the way uh, cash is managed, on the way it's implemented, it's monitored, and so we saw that yesterday. This major it had a major fiscal impact on the deficit, which really went up uh, up to 11, 12 percent. That needs to be financed by Treasury, and also on public debt, uh, which went up from 8 to 9 percent. So that's uh, that's quite meaningful. I also noted yesterday in the, <clears throat> from the different presentations and discussions the difficulty to balance this short-term response. Uh, we want to be quick uh, to avert the crisis, or at least mitigate it, but also balance that with medium-term fiscal sustainability objectives, and particularly in countries which went through painful fiscal consolidation, uh, trying to keep this balance uh, wasn't always easy. <clears throat> also due to the time frame of this crisis, initially we all thought it would go away in three months, obviously it did not, uh, and so we needed to prepare a bit for the long run. Uh, another point yesterday was the mounting fiscal risks and contingent liabilities, where the discussion was uh, also a bit on, on SOEs with SUHA. <clears throat> and so while initially the focus was really central government, more and more our countries uh, take a whole, whole of government, whole of public sector approach, uh, not just in terms of the treasury, but also in terms of managing uh, the risks and liabilities. <clears throat> and so therefore, uh, the, the difficulty of monitoring. <clears throat> so another an important point that was uh, subject to a lot of discussion, particularly in the second session yesterday, was the challenge to monitor um, the COVID expenditures and impact. And so that's something we'll discuss a bit more today in our first session, like to see how treasuries can help, how information systems, accounting, uh, rules and regulations uh, can help to ensure a proper monitoring reporting of this unprecedented fiscal uh, emergency stimulus. Um, so we'll go in, into more details for that. So we'll have um, the first session. Let me remind you that today's session, unlike yesterday, uh, 60 minutes, not 90 minutes. 
So our time is a bit shorter. We'll need to be a bit more efficient, but should be very efficient. <clears throat> so the first session will look at what countries did uh, to monitor COVID, uh, this exceptional COVID expenditures, but also the lessons learned from this and um, what, what we can take from it uh, to build stronger systems in the future, build resilience, um, and uh, res actually respond to this urgent reporting need and need for transparency without necessarily disrupting uh, the more medium-term and comprehensive uh, accounting and reporting processes. So we have a great panel, which uh, consists of uh, three presenters. Mark Phillips, um, who is a seasoned PFM specialist with over 30 years of experience in PFM, both in the government uh, of Australia, the Treasury of Australia, as well as uh, advising governments around the world, including in PEMPA. So 30, 36 years of experience, so I'm, I'm assuming he started at age 14. That shows you a bit the wealth of experience uh, that we have there. His experience in PEMPAL will also be very convenient uh, to continue a bit the cross fertilization we had uh, started in Moscow. Then we have uh, Wiwin Instanti. She's Director of Accounting at the Indonesia Treasury. And before, she was Director of Budget Execution, so she, she receives both sides. She holds a master in public administration from Japan. Hajime Mashte, we win. And then we have Mr. Mot Sabri Binyakup, Deputy Director of Accounting at the Malaysian Accountant General's Department. He holds a CPA from Malaysia and Australia and will therefore hopefully understand Mark's accent. Uh, so these are just the, the three main speakers. We also then have country updates from Myanmar and from Laos. Um, so this is uh, Kin So, Deputy General Director of Treasury from Myanmar, has kindly agreed to share uh, their experience in five minutes. And uh, Mr. Wingsom Fetsnuan, Deputy Director of the National Treasury, will also share uh, the Lao experience. So without uh, further ado, let me hand over to Mark uh, for his 10-minute presentation. And, and we will send you, to, maybe just a heads up to our presenters, we'll send you a quick Reminder when you're coming close to the interview. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, uh, be joining you today. I just want to make sure that this is my screen is sharing. Is the screen sharing? No. Sorry, I don't see it. Okay. It's early. No, no. It's uh -huh. earlier. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, uh, today I'm I'm presenting on monitoring and reporting on, on the use of impact of COVID spending. And uh, Fabian's already mentioned that I have a, a, a long uh, history and relationship with, um, with PenPal. And in fact, this is actually largely drawn from a paper that PenPal recently uh, produced and is now available on the PenPal website as well. Um, and as Fabian mentioned, we are looking uh, PenPal and and PenPal for uh, further uh, cross fertilisation and support. So PenPal would welcome feedback on the paper as well from uh, from PenPal. Um, so I I don't go I manage my time well. Um, I will uh, move on to the to the first points. Um, Basically, one of the things we all know in contemporary government, uh, contemporary situations, uh, the demand for government information, the de demand for more complex information is growing and growing and growing. Um, there are continual uh, expectations of, of our ability to source this information and provide it in a very, in a, almost like an instant fashion. And uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on all of us. And COVID is just one of many examples in recent history of, of information that's required urgently and information that's expected to be reliable and, and useful for decision making. So we've all been imposed with this in treasuries for many years in all of our countries. Um, uh, the, the question is whether we've been able to do something uh, in a structured way that actually improves our timeliness and our reliability of reporting on these issues. And that's one of the things I wanted to focus on today is how this could be possible uh, both uh, immediately and, and longer term into the future. So in PenPal, we had a number of countries present about six months ago on some of their urgent responses to COVID reporting. 
And the four, I'm not going to go through them in detail, uh, given the time constraints, but basically four countries provided or undertook specific changes or additions to their uh, uh, existing chart of account structures to enhance their ability to produce reports and track information in their financial management information systems. So the four at the top you see there, each of them took different, um, uh, looked at different aspects of the chart of accounts or a combination of them. And they were then able to produce in a very, very rapid way, specific information regarding um, uh, COVID related spending, whether it was the source of the financing or the actual spending itself. So that was very, very impressive from all of those countries, uh, particularly the speed with which that was undertaken. The fifth country, the Ukraine, actually took a slightly different approach. In their case, what they decided to do was rather than change the chart of account structures, um, they actually uh, codified the transactions themselves at another stage in FMIS, the payment stage, and they actually flagged payments where they believe those payments specifically related to COVID-relating spending. This meant that they didn't impact the existing integrity of the chart of accounts, uh, but we're still able to produce financial reports and information from FMIS on COVID. So that was quite a novel way to do it. Um, and the, the benefit of that was that if the changes that were being undertaken in the chart of accounts would have replaced existing reporting capabilities, the Ukraine didn't impact on, 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 on that when they did the changes. So that's the big challenge. When you do changes within the chart of account structure itself, you want to make sure that those changes are not mutually exclusive that the changes actually replace or impede uh, traditional or current reporting requirements, which are also important. And that's the, all, the constant battle that we have with, um, with modify, modifying our reporting or extracting additional information. Uh, when we make changes to the existing chart of accounts, it could actually change um, the integrity of the original reporting requirements. So moving along. So there's a lot of challenges in the way countries have developed chart of accounts traditionally as well. And I think this is a, uh, something that we really need to put out there and, and, and discuss because we have to find a way to overcome those um, silos between different entities and it, sometimes the limited def, uh, design and focus of chart of accounts that are, that are being implemented in countries. One of the challenges is that the entities that often are responsible for developing the segments in the chart of accounts focus on their needs, for whether it's the Ministry of Finance, uh, whether it's a budget department, whether it's the Treasury. Um, they may not take into account the broader government requirements, for example, statistical reporting or management reporting in the line ministries. And if you don't take those uh, into account, then the reality is that the system and the chart of, chart of account structure will not support those broader reporting requirements and may in fact limit um, uh, the ability for that agency itself to do better, better and more detailed interrogation or respond to things like a uh, um, uh, request for COVID related spending. So it's very important when we do develop uh, or redevelop our unified chart of accounts that we do focus on the broader requirements, the consolidated requirements, and we, we seek to as much as possible bring all of the requirements across the general government sector into the existing unified chart of accounts. And that's really important that, that we overcome those barriers and those, those silos in doing that. And I know this is a contemporary issue for a number of countries have, uh, having worked in many recently in this area. So when we're designing the chart of accounts, what should we uh, focus on? Well, firstly, we need to make sure that the main requirements in modern government are dealt with. And these seven segments, which are presented here in blue, are really the main requirements. I've worked in countries right from China uh, to Montserrat, so one of the biggest countries to one of the smallest. And the common requirements are, 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 pretty, are pretty clear, that we need to know where the money comes from, we need to know who spends the money and where it's spent, we need to know what it's, uh, to know what it's spent on and in which sector. And, and in, in modern government, we also want to uh, man, manage and analyse the performance and, use of that, and the use of that money as well. And we generally want to be able to separately report things like projects for capital spending and for other, other requirements. So all of those things are quite common. And it's really important when we do develop those segments in the chart of accounts that we take, again, a consolidated uh, general government view, sometimes a, a public sector view, and we ensure that we can build in the requirements for reporting and, and providing information from all of those possible sources and from all of those operations in government. So we want to make sure that extra budgetary funds are involved. We want to make sure that um, we can report own source revenues of, of line ministries. We also, also ultimately want to be able to support 
and report things which are not considered directly part of the state budget or the budget as well. It's really important. And a very important key is to have a, a very strong, uh, sound economic segment that actually links between the main reporting requirements of government. If you want more on all of this, the paper describes it, and there's also some very good documents um, also with the IMF and Pulsar that, uh, that provide guidance on this as well. So one of the things that we've now, we now realise is that when we developed that, the chart of accounts, even when we developed it comprehensively, as I've pointed out in the previous slide, sometimes we have reporting requirements that still are not uh, are well met from those existing structures. We try to map them from those existing structures and we, we fail to provide an adequate report or we miss key uh, requirements because there's a relationship of many to many or, or, or one to many in terms of the transactions. And so what we may need to do in many countries, and I suspect in all countries ultimately, is we need to create an additional segment capability, which actually allows us to uh, introduce additional cross-cutting reporting requirements. Now, I've mentioned two here, one which is contemporary, which is COVID, and the other which uh, relates to gender budgeting, which is very, uh, uh, and climate change, sorry, I mentioned climate change here, but there's also gender budgeting. These are all things which, which most governments are, are, are contending with at the moment in terms of cross-cutting reporting, and they're looking for solutions for how they can extract information from existing reporting systems and existing transactional coding systems um, without impinging existing reporting requirements. And this cross-cutting segment is probably the, 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 um, uh, the way. Uh, there may not always be a need for it, and if there's not, then don't create it. But we think that in general, there will need to be this flexible capacity in the future for both short-term requirements or medium-term requirements like COVID and longer-term requirements as well. So, for example, gender budgeting or climate change. Hopefully, COVID is a, a short-term impact. Um, so what we're looking at here then is how do we achieve uh, the maximum utility of the unified chart of accounts if we develop those seven segments I mentioned and the eighth, which focuses on the cross-cutting requirements. Well, we then make that a universal uh, or, or a unified chart of accounts, which operates across all elements of government. Even if the spending units or accounting units are, um, or cost centres are using their own accounting systems, we would still impose this structure on them they can then enhance it and, and, mod and update it or expand on it uh, for additional detail as they require, but they would be required to have that at the core of their own charts of accounts and to be able to report back centrally on that. Now, I, ideally what we would be able to do in, in a modern IT environment is create some sort of, uh, of financial portal and be able to pull information in from all of these sources on a continual basis, perhaps, perhaps in real time, perhaps each day. But to do that, we need to get the data exchange uh, requirements right, and the unified chart of accounts is the key for that. This also means that what we can create in government is a unified process across all major government public financial management systems. And that's, again, not to say that the revenue system won't have additional classifiers, that the project management system in the, in the, um, in the Department of Capital Works or the Ministry of Capital Works won't have additional classifiers, but we need to identify the common unified chart of accounts requirements, the integrated data requirements for, a, for the metadata, so that we can actually create the exchange of information across the whole PFM environment seamlessly. And this is really key, and it requires the bringing together of a whole range of stakeholders, a whole right range of decision makers to agree on what those common data requirements are and to let go uh, in some ways of their uh, desire to have control over specific areas uh, without consideration for the, for the total picture. And this is really challenging in every country, but it's so critical that we get this right. Countries, many countries are trying to overcome this by developing mapping tables and APIs. The problem with that is if the original data is not classified correctly and at the most detailed level when it's captured, it may not be possible to produce all of the reporting requirements that are required now and in the future. So we need to get the comprehensiveness of the, of the system in place and the data definitions in place as well. So to summarise, um, we need access to complex reports. There's going to be a, a continual demand we can expect the demand to actually grow, not to, not to decrease over time. In fact, though, the, it's likely that as stakeholders become more aware of the capabilities, they will want even more from us as well. 
This means we've got to design and, and, and manage our uh, segments in the unified chart of accounts very carefully. It's very important we don't take a narrow view of, of their operation or implementation. We're not designing it just for accounting, for financial reporting. We're not just designing it for budget reporting either. Both of those are critically important, but they're not the only requirement for government-based uh, uh, reporting. And it's very important that we consider all of those things. Consolidation, therefore, is the key. So getting it right, having an expanded view of the environment and, and ensuring that we have integrity across the framework is critical. And this will also support us in, in directly responding to COVID. In the countries that I mentioned in the, in the earlier slides, most of them had a fairly comprehensive unified chart of accounts in place. And so they were able to produce quite quickly, reasonably quality uh, financial rep uh, reports for COVID anyway. But in most cases, they would benefit also from this cross-cutting um, uh, capability as well. And it needs to be, uh, the cross-cutting things needs to be uh, embedded stably in the unified chart of accounts structure, but it would allow flexibility to be, to be applied over time. Of course, with flexibility comes complexity, and it would be very important for the managers of the unified chart of accounts and the cross-cutting segment to make sure that they have strong communication and strong monitoring of the use of that segment so that we ensure that the quality of the data um, uh, um, transactional recording is, is actually of a high order. So this would support both ongoing requirements that would be enduring, like, like we see with things like gender budgeting and, and obviously the evolving challenge of climate change, and also would allow you to respond to shorter term requirements like COVID and, for example, a specific event like a typhoon. Um, where you might want to track both the immediate recurrent spending and the longer term capital spending for particular um, uh, natural events that, that create damage. So I'll, I'll stop there, Fabian, and, and hand, hand back to you. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know if I have an echo. So stop the other one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Better now. Yeah, no, thank you uh, for also keeping to the time with such a substantive presentation. We'd always, uh, we'd, we would need a, half, a whole day uh, on that. Uh, so this was just a, a primer. And maybe Mark can share his paper through the chat box so that uh, colleagues can have a look. And we can certainly organize uh, future sessions to go a bit more in depth. And what I found quite interesting in Mark's presentation is different experience, PEMPAD experiences of our country have dealt with this uh, sudden and, and, and urgent need uh, for tracking, reporting, and accounting for these uh, very important COVID expenditures. Different uh, approaches have been used, sources of funds, coding, program segment coding, administrative and economic classification, but also the risk of, of these uh, sometimes ad hoc measures in terms of the, uh, the integrity uh, of the entire chart of accounts and therefore the need to move towards a more integrated unified chart account with cross-cutting segments, which will be very important for an increasing number of cross-cutting themes, which are expected uh, to be seen in the financial accounts, uh, climate, gender, for instance. So that's, I mean, that's a great experience. Uh, happy to have further discussion on that. But uh, before that, let's, let us move to Indonesia and hear from uh, Mrs. Instanti uh, how uh, Indonesia has dealt with this need uh, for COVID monitoring and tracking. Over to you, uh, Mrs. Instanti. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to present monitoring and reporting on the uses and impact of COVID spending, emphasizing the reporting side from a chart of account or to a perspective in case of Indonesian government. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, the world is facing a COVID-19 pandemic that affects all aspects of human life. In the global economy, the world is experiencing a real threat of an economic crisis. The economic contraction is fundamentally different from the previous ones. Government around the world 
implement large scale social restriction and lockdown. For Indonesia, in responding to disruptions in economic activity, government has intervened in handling the COVID-19 pandemic by issuing various policies in the management of revenues, expenditures, and sources of financing. For the various policies that have been issued, accountability for state financial policies that are extraordinary policies in the handling and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has its own challenges in order to convince the public that the state budget is managed efficiently, transparently, and accountably. And the government is constantly improve the quality of public finance management based on government uh, governance principle in line with the preparation of guidelines for the application of relevant accounting standards in the preparation of government financial statements. The government has decided on several strategies and public financial policies that are extraordinary policies to reduce the impact of the pandemic. The strategy and policy of state finance are directed, among others, through refocusing activities and budget reallocation to increasing spending on facilities and health services, providing social assistance and stimulus for businesses. This policy is accompanied by a mix of financing strategies for financial system stability for micro, small, and medium enterprises and corporate sectors, including government direct funding activities and financing from financial markets. They are divided into six clusters here in the blue box. The success of implementing government expenditure is closely related to compliance with laws and regulations. For this reason, it is necessary to review the regulations needed in handling the COVID-19 pandemic and able to fulfill new transaction activities in line with handling the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the national economic recovery program, which can later be accounted for. There is also a need for adequate disclosure in financial reports and support from the government internal supervisory bodies to be an important part of maintaining the quality of the program and the presentation of financial statements. Not only the substance of the bill of expenses for handling the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic by using the appropriate special account, but also the truth for the existence of government expenditure, the exact amount of goods or services, money and suppliers. In addition, the use and improvement of information system is another important factor in adequate disclosure in financial reports in the context of handling the COVID-19 pandemic. In carrying out the budget tracking policy, the government stipulates the use of a special COVID-19 account in all stages of the budget cycle that includes planning and budgeting, budget execution, accounting and reporting, and also audit. Then the special COVID account is 
set up throughout the financial report application, which will produce financial reports in the state general treasurer and state ministries. All of which will be consolidated into the central government financial statements. The full accountability for the activities of ministries, the state general treasurer and the central government during the handling and or impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is manifested in each financial report so that budget marking or budget tracking is needed to be able to describe the budget realization related to handling the COVID-19 pandemic in the form of using a special account in chart of account. The COVID-19 special account is used for the first planning or allocation or maybe revised budget and then also on the cycle of budget execution and also on financial reporting. In addition, information was collected regarding the realization of spending in the context of handling the COVID-19 pandemic. On the slide, uh, all of you can see examples of the use of both non-COVID-19 and COVID-19 accounts. Furthermore, in providing guidelines for implementing relevant accounting standards in the preparation of government financial statements, it can be explained that all parts of the government accounting standards can be applied during the COVID-19 pandemic. Financial report preparers uh, still use government accounting standards that is appropriate, appropriate and relevant. For example, uh, statement number one of government accounting standard about preparation of financial statement and the second one is government accounting standard statement number two, uh, sorry, number four about notes of financial statement and then uh, government accounting standard statement number six about investment accounting, number nine about liability accounting and also uh, government accounting standard boards uh, release technical bulletin number 13 about grant accounting and number 19 about accrual-based social assistance accounting. The COVID-19 pandemic is an extraordinary event, but its handling is based on statutory provisions which are fully under government control no special presentation or addition of new codes in, is required. In preparing the financial report, the government can provide additional information to explain the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and its handling activities. Additional information adjusted to the needs or required in the laws and regulations. In order to meet adequate disclosure, the information that needs to be disclosed in the financial statements should contain at least general information on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on health, economy, and financial policy. The second one is uh, all steps taken by the government in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The third one is refocusing and reallocation of health spending budget, social safety nets, and economic strengthening. 
And then an explanation for the decline in revenue as a result of changes in macroeconomic condition. And the last one is budget changes due to refocusing and budget reallocation for handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, I want to emphasize that it is our role in case of government of Indonesia to maintain accountability for financial statements by our profession. I hope participants can share experiences and knowledge in implementing monitoring and reporting for handling COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. Have a fruitful and insightful online plenary conference. Stay healthy. May God always bless all of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Zinsanti, for this both substantive and, and timely presentation about uh, Indonesia's experience <clears throat> and how, how the Ministry of Finance has issued special regulations for COVID expenditures and used the different ways to track and report these expenditures, both uh, using the special account marking the line, um, the line department internal relocations, but also notes on payment orders, uh, which was quite interesting, and then monthly payment plans, COVID payment plans and COVID re reports. So I think this uh, really enables you a very close monitoring of COVID expenditures, which is uh, quite impressive and certainly necessary given uh, the size of Indonesia's COVID response in the country. Uh, let us uh, please now move to Malaysia and hear from uh, Mr. Bin Yaqub um, to see uh, how Malaysia has dealt with this using the different trust funds. Thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Bin Yaqub. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Pebin. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. So, I'm trying to share my presentation, actually. Uh, let me, let me, let me uh, give me some time to share my presentation. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum and uh, very good morning to everybody. My name is Muhammad Sabri bin Yaakob. Can you hear me? It's clear, yes. clear enough. Okay. So this is uh, okay. Actually, uh, I'm sharing uh, the same uh, topic as everybody. It is about the. Uh, it's about the, it's been, yeah, we're, we're not seeing your presentation. Maybe it's me, but we're seeing your, your computer screen, but not the presentation. Not the presentation. Okay. So I think it's just a matter of opening it on, on your computer and then share screen and then it should, uh, I think that's one option or else just share directly the document. Oh, that yes, 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 fantastic. It's yeah. there. But we're ready on, uh, yeah, great. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the concept of the, uh, for, for my presentation for today is, um, the first one is about the consolidated fund account and the friendship between the, Sorry, sorry. The relationship between the computer fund accounts, the action taken, and the monitoring and reporting of the COVID-19. Okay. Uh, as for the considered fund accounts, this is where uh, uh, we we base our accounting uh, accounting in uh, Malaysia is based on the federal constitution, where we have 
three accounts that we have to maintain. That is a cost of revenue account, loan account, and also the trust account. Okay, this is uh, the trust uh, for the revenue account. Okay, this is where the revenue and the expenditure of the government, the budgeted one, it raises, we have the tax expenditure and also the supply expenditure come from. We count everything, the revenue and also the expenditure uh, through this account. Our accounts is actually uh, revolve around the fund accounting. We have three funds. That is, this is the first one, considered revenue account. And each account, we have a fund code, a separate fund code in the charge of, in the charge of account to, you know, to charge the expenditure or revenue for each uh, fund or revenue or account. So for this one, the revenue account, which involves the revenue of the government and also the expenditure, the budgeted expenditure, we are using the G000 for revenue, B and T, and to differentiate the, uh, the transaction between the other two accounts, so we are using this G, B, and T for this considered revenue account. And then we have considered loan account, where, where which account uh, for the receipt and payment of these uh, loans or borrowings. So some of the amount is used to pay the loan, and some is used to uh, fund the development trust fund. It is for the development expenditure and some part of it is transferred to the COVID-19 trust fund. Okay, so for this loan account, we are using the fund code G triple zero. And then we have this uh, considered trust account. Okay, this one is uh, where we create a trust that is, uh, we have two types of trust. The government trust and also the public trust. Okay, for this one, each of these trusts have their own fund account, which begin with E for the government trust and L for the public trust. Included in this trust account is one account that we create for the purpose of COVID nineteen. That is. COVID-19 trust fund. Okay, as for the chart of account structure, for the first one, this is uh, only the main uh, component in the chart of account. The first one is the ministry or the controlling officer. And the second level is fund, which is a uh, key type of fund, that is the revenue, uh, loan, and also trust. And the third one, is the program activity and projects and also the what one is account with the output all this level in this chart of town has their own code and to differentiate uh, or to report uh, for the transaction that being done for <coughs> each one okay as for the second uh, second like everybody else so there are so many uh, initiatives uh, being announced by the government okay, for uh, COVID-19. So there is a stimulus package, short-term retirement plan announced by the government, involved the allocation from the government and also from the DLC companies and other parties. The government is using the current budget allocation uh, for this purpose. At first, it is not sufficient due to the decline in the revenue for about 20. 15 to 20 percent. So, due to this, the COVID 19 Act 2020, the measures for reducing the impact of coronavirus disease 2019 was passed in August to pull the, all the expenditure related to COVID 19 into one new trust account called COVID 19 Trust Fund. The source of the fund comes from borrowing. So, we create a New government trust account, uh, the COVID 19 trust account, where the fund will be used to economy, to, uh, to stimulate the economy of the country 
and there are three, 31 details which says speak allocation according to the purpose. So at first, from uh, February to October, we have been using the uh, fund from the current allocation to finance the uh, initiative announced by the government. So uh, after yeah, after the bill ha has been passed in October, we have to reclass all the expenditures concerned with COVID-19 into the COVID-19 trust fund. So the relevant expenditures, the operating and development expenditure related to COVID-19 has been reclassified to COVID-19 trust fund. So from there, we can track and monitor the expenditure from this COVID-19 allocation according to the ministry the specific purpose for the uh, COVID-19 uh, expenditure and also according to the state of the allocation uh, concern given. Okay, this is the action taken by the government uh, from, uh, from our perspective. The operating expenditure and development expenditure has been uh, transferred or classified to the COVID-19 trust fund or COVID-19 trust fund. So, uh, like I said before, the operating expenditure and the development expenditure, they have their own fund code, which separate, uh, which can, uh, we can differentiate from the report. So we know that this is the operating expenditure based on the codes, the fund code used, uh, that is G00, B and T. And for the development, say, we are using the P. As for the COVID-19, uh, we are using the E code or P99 differentiate the transition for COVID-19 to other funds. As for the monitoring and reporting, okay, this is uh, the example of the uh, our reports for COVID-19 reports. So we can see here, so there is a fund that is P99 and then we have the list of project, the 31 list of project and the expenditure and the performance of the expenditure. So as at today, uh, we have spent around 38 billion ringgit is about 10 billion from the fund to uh, fund the expenditure on the COVID-19. As for the reporting in the financial statement, so we have to do some adjustment to the uh, our performance uh, report. This is our revenue. The revenue is always based on the government income from tax, non-tax, and so on. And then we have operating expenditure yeah, from the uh, revenue account. So this is all the budgeted amount for the operating expenditure. So after that, we have a surplus of or deficit. And then we have uh, the development expenditure uh, for capital, capital uh, related expenditure which is uh, the source partly come from the revenues, but most of it come from the uh, borrowings. And then we have COVID-19 expenditures. This is the new line that we included in our report. So COVID-19 expenditures that is based or the source of finances uh, come from borrowings uh, will be added up together to show the overall, overall deficit of the government. So then the deficit funded by, uh, there, there will be figures on that loan and foreign system and so on. Okay, yes, uh, then as for the financial statement of the government, we are uh, like, uh, like other countries, we have to put some additional uh, notes on the COVID-19 expenditure. So additional disclosure about the COVID-19 trust fund and also the financial performance of the government in 2020 as compared to the previous year's uh, report due to the pandemic effect will be disclosed in detail in our reports. So I think that's all from my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ben Yacoub, uh, for sharing uh, the Malaysian experience. Um, it's interesting to note uh, how you've created a dedicated COVID trust fund largely financed from the loan account, which is understandable given the 
sheer size of uh, Malaysia's COVID response, but also using a reclassification of existing current and capital expenditures, which we have also seen in, in other countries. Um, so a very interesting experience. Let me turn over to Mrs. King so Oh from uh, Myanmar to hear about, about their experience. Uh, maybe five minutes, please keep it short, because I already see quite a few questions in the chat box. And so it's good to have some discussion uh, on, on these. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. I will present the monetary and reporting on the users and impact of the COVID-19 spending, emphasizing the reporting side from the chattel account perspective. In Myanmar, the first wave of the COVID uh, in Myanmar, the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic started on the uh, 23rd March 2020. The first confirmed case was imported. The second wave has occurred by the local transmission at the beginning of the August. It is having a more severe impact than the first wave. Uh, as of the 14th December uh, 2020, the cases uh, are like those figures. Could you pull up the full screen, please? Well, if you can just share orally your experience, you know, there's no need to have a full presentation. It was really just to hear a bit of uh, country update from your experience. So we don't need to go through the entire slide, which can be shared with the committee later, but really just sharing your, your experience. Uh, Mr. King, so in terms of the account, the use of shut up accounts for tracking COVID expenditures. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh um, I will con I will I will continue. Yes. This one? Uh, yeah. Okay, I will continue. The government has responded to COVID-19 um, um, for the measurement of the disease prevention treatment program, uh, direct financial assistance to the vulnerable household through in-kind and cash transfer, uh, reduction in household electricity charges, financial assistance to business through uh, uh, through uh, loan grantee and test affordable and exemption. Therefore, uh, the, the, um, the government reallocate the budget for the 2019-20 and prioritize the expenditure. Uh, we overcame the first wave of the uh, <coughs> first wave is, uh, successfully. During the second wave, the end of the um, end of the fiscal year 2019 and 20, the government has allocated 1.47 billion years generous of him to the natural disaster management fund for the battle against the COVID-19. So we uh, we also have an external uh, financial assistance system from the Waban JICA ADB IMF. So the government increased the budget for the program and supply supplementary for the entitlement for the those writing in the pandemic uh, provisions and control. So um, COVID-19 expenses and revenue, all transactions are record by the um, budget account head accordingly. Those are mentioned as two items under the budget account head, as usual item and COVID-19 item in the financial report. But current Myanmar financial report system is only, we use that only two digits of the budget account head for the reporting format. 
for the spanning unit, and they are recording the four digit standard like the account head, sub account head, etc. So for the uh, COVID-19, Treasury Department prepared the special financial report of the COVID-19 by collecting the information from the line agency. So COVID-19 expenditures and revenue cannot see in regular financial report uh, in Myanmar. So, but uh, Myanmar is uh, now implementing the uh, um, BFM project, uh, modernizing the BFM project regarding the chattel account. Uh, the unifying chattel account is uh, one of the BFM project reform procedure. So to develop the uh, unifying chattel account in Myanmar, we are working together with the IMF, World Bank, and, well, IMF and World Bank. Actually, there are several components of the unifying chattel account. But current plan is to implement the administrative code and economic code. So Myanmar also they committed to reform of the public accounting or focus on the uniform chattel account, financial reporting, and computerized system. And for the uh, chattel account reform process, the first steps are underway, and it will be long journey. This is the what uh, uh, what we are doing the unified chattel account in Myanmar. Let me start my here presentation. Thank you so much. Sorry for your inconvenience for the presentation. Not at all. On the contrary, thank you very much for this very rich uh, country update and uh, very very useful. Um, it's so interesting to see that uh, in these days you're using a combination of budget report, uh, procurement, uh, MEB. Uh, Treasury account uh, payment uh, information to keep track of your COVID responses and consolidated reporting. But I'm also, I'm also noting the very important reform uh, you're undertaking on the unified chart of accounts, which will hopefully uh, strengthen a bit uh, the preparedness for future crisis. I think one important lesson learned of this COVID crisis is that uh, we, one needs flexibility uh, in, this, in this account. Uh, but uh, let me quickly uh, turn to uh, Jenkson Festin uh, to hear from him. Um, no need for a PowerPoint presentation, just a quick update on how Lao has been dealing with the reporting and what it aims to do. Thank you. And so can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Oh, now you're muted. Yes, now. Uh, good morning, all participants. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, good, good morning, good morning. All participants. Can you hear me? Good, great. Right. Okay. Um, uh, uh, my, my name, name is Yang Son from uh, Treasury Department of Lao. Uh, first, first of all, I would like to update the uh, Lao situation for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the, 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 the number. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Hello. Can can you hear me? Hello. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. <laughs> yeah. Can hear clearly enough. Hello? Fabian, can you hear me, Fabian? <laughs> there are two mics turned on at the moment. From Lao. From Lao. Okay, thank you. Hi, Fabian. Yes, 
we have two mics, now we have, we have no mic. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's better if you turn on your individual mic and turn off your VC mic, you know, in the, in the big room, the big VC mic. That seems to be uh, eating more bandwidth. If you, if, you go, if you just keep your computer mic, that, that would go well. Yes. Okay, Vien Song, would you like to continue? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I will update you the number of the um, the the case. There are 40, 40, 41 cases confirmed and recover uh, 34 and still on uh, active case in five person. So even the number of the of the case is small, but um, the pandemic uh, effect to lung chronic loss, especially, especially for the food import and export, and also effect to our, our, our SME. So this is effect to our living new collection. It doesn't meet yet. So the government uh, uh, request to National Assembly to uh, approve the revision of the budget for 2000. Um, by leaving no, uh, reduce the limit no by 30% and expenditure uh, by 20 to 30%. So what what they tertiary doing for the budget execution now? So um, we has been postponed some uh, unnecessarily um uh, the the payment and some expenditure we postponed to the year 2021 so for the budget we used to respond the covid-19 pandemic we have uh, from two sources uh the first one we uh, received from the social contribution which we open uh, three account uh, in lao kip and thai baht and U us dollar so the money we got from the social contribution, we used to buy the hospital equipment, ambulance, and and we uh, give to the uh, uh, local level for, at the hospital at the local level. And the second one, we have the government reserve fund, or we call a contingent fund. This uh, this this uh, fund we really record on our core finance system on GFIS. I, I mean that really caught on our C, on our COA, but we separately from the uh, budget that we use normally for for annual for the uh, Ministry of Health for the hospital at both um, uh, cent central and 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 provincial level. And I, I would like to update you. Uh, currently, we are developing our new FME system. So, so it is good uh, that we can improve uh, our COA to be the new uh, international standard, then we can uh, adapt to our FME system. So thank you for my update for Lao, Lao update. Great. Thank you very much, uh, it's, it's a good time to work on the uniform, unified uh, chart of accounts uh, that will underpin your, your myth. Uh, so as we have uh, 15 minutes uh, left for the chat, but the chat has actually already started uh, throughout the session. I guess that's the benefit of these uh, online uh, uh, meetings. Uh, so we, we can already have exchanges. I saw good questions uh, and responses uh, from Lao on the Unified Child Account, questions on Indonesia's presentation uh, regarding local government's accounting and consolidation. Uh, so let me open up uh, to the rest of the participants to see if there are any questions or comments uh, on any of these presentations. Who wants to go first? And uh, let, me, sorry, let me also remind you that uh, we're looking for a volunteer for this session and another volunteer for the next session. 
uh, to share their takeaways in the wrap-up session. We'll happily share uh, our notes with the volunteers, but uh, please come forward. Any oral uh, comments or question or as I go through the chat, although I have the impression that most chats have already been answered, but there was going to be one question about uh, the, the use of the chart of accounts at local governments and how to reconcile the, the COVID expenditures done by central governments and local governments. Um, question for Indonesia. Yes. Uh, Fabian, just uh, actually, just this is not really the first but, uh, uh, comment. I think uh, it was a very uh, important point to raise that uh, the chart of uh, there's a distinction between uh, implementation of chart of accounts for national government or uh, central governments and local government units. At least in the Philippines, it's really a challenge to uh, to get uh, to get the uh, local governments to adopt the. Uh, chart of accounts because uh, we have given them substantial uh, autonomy in how they conduct matters. But really, uh, again, it, it, it's really important that the uh, two is uh, harmonized uh, when it comes to you know consult consolidation of public sector uh, on an entire public sector uh, viewpoint. Now, the only uh, reason, the only, now, uh, the only upside, if you can call it uh, an upside, is that. Uh, the bulk of the expenditures really uh, for the entire government of the Philippines is really coming from the national government. So if you can capture the expenditures of the national government or the transactions of the national government in an accurate and timely manner, then you pretty much know what the government of the Philippines is doing. So that's the uh, that's the only upside of for, uh, for us. But it's been really tough to uh, do that. The also another challenge when it comes to uh, the uh, implementation of the chart of accounts is that, for example, our debt monitoring system, the one we got from the UMTAD, the, uh, uh, the, the DM pass, which I think some of the uh, our country uh, members here are also using, it's the issue really is that they're not, uh, they're not uh, compliant with the our uh, unified chart of accounts. So what's happening is that there's a lot of challenges in terms of uh, integrating the DM pass system, the debt monitoring system, to the um, if miss that we are currently uh, implementing. So I think uh, so. That's why it's really good to see uh, the. Uh, I mean, the uh, presentations demonstrate you know, that the work needed to uh, address those issues are really important. Uh, we are worth it in terms of the information and the. Uh, uh, accuracy of the uh, information that we can easily generate. So those are my two cents. Thank you. Fabian, could I, could I, yeah, could I just uh, add something to that? It's Mark here. Please, please. Yeah, that's, look, that was a really um, very, very well, well uh, stated set of points there about uh, one of the challenges that so many countries have today and a particularly developed country, what are called developed countries, who have gone through massive decentralization of authority and uh, and particularly things like systems uh, one of the the things that those countries gave away often was the ability to then then easily consolidate information back to the center um, and the classification is just one case in point and i certainly know from my own country's uh, uh, position um, there was no uh, uh, initial consideration about the need to consolidate either across levels of government or even to a certain degree, um, back from line ministries to set to the centre, and a lot of these things had to be fixed post event. Um, and so, countries that haven't gone through down through that process yet, or don't plan to, you've got a big advantage over the countries that have have, have done, undertaken significant decentralisation. And there, there really is no uh, uh, choice but for in the countries that have uh, the, the disparate. 
uh, chart of accounts and, and uh, structures to try and come up with some sort of solution to unify as best they can. Um, and anyone who's looked at the UK's consolidated financial statements, for example, you know, 33% of all transactions are also netted off. So there's another challenge with um, with having without having a consistent structure that allows you to um, uh, identify the, the you know the source of transactions and where they've gone is that you actually then have potential misstatement of information because a lot of the information is actually within the consolidated reporting entity too. So definitely a, a, a major challenge for some countries and one that that um, will need to bring these different parties together to provide some sort of uh, unified structure uh, for for the you know the better reporting of all. No, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, and not not to mention uh, also then consolidating the information coming from agencies and SOEs, which uh, are often on IFRS and outside but are very present in the health sector, for instance, right? Um, so we also have a question from uh, the Treasury of Vietnam uh, to Indonesia and Malaysia. How long did you update existing IT for tracking and reporting expenditure for, uh, for COVID? So it's a question about uh, the time. Um, so how long this update, uh, how, how long this update takes? for tracking and if it's something that will uh, will be permanent. So maybe if I may add to that question, uh, summing up further uh, former questions on the consolidation of local and and uh, central government spending, it wasn't clear to me if that's also uh, regarding the COVID expenditure. So if you're using the same uh, tracking and marking at local government, then therefore you're able to produce uh, consolidated uh, COVID expenditure uh, reports. Thank you. Over to you. Who wants to go first? Indonesia, Malaysia? Uh, thank you, Prabhupada. So, uh, as for Malaysia, we are we are reporting on the COVID-19 based on the central government expenses. So, we have the uh, update daily. And then we send it to our MOF friends there to track the impact and the use of the expenditure. So we have uh, the federal government or central government expenditure uh, reporting by day daily. So for today, by the next day, we have the report. Uh, we are not consolidating the uh, local government and the state's government expenditure on COVID together with the central government. It is only for the central government. The bill pass is for the uh, central government, not uh, including the state and the local government. Okay. Thanks a lot. If I may just follow up, there's another question uh, from Myanmar uh, to you uh, on on your, the differences between your budget execution report uh, reporting and the financial performance reporting. Uh, okay. Uh, the difference. So uh, as for the reporting, uh, we report uh, the performance of the budget execution, uh, the budget uh, allocation, actually. So the budget uh, we report in our financial statement is the budget allocation and the result, uh, the actual expenditure of this. So the revenue is come from the uh, various uh, type of revenue tax and so on. And the expenditure is because we are still uh, in cash accounting, we are reporting on all the budget uh, execution uh, of the federal government, the central government. So it is the same, the budget performance and the, uh, what we call the uh, financial performance of the government is actually the budget uh, execution result. Thank you very much. A question to uh, Indonesia then, how long did it take you to update your information system, your IFMIS, uh, the SPAN, uh, to cope with this tracking? And also to what extent are you consolidating COVID expenditures uh, from the national and the local level? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, three questions on uh, chat room 
the first question from uh, Nguyen about question uh, about choa of span and sakti are the same of different uh, my colleague has uh, answered this questions that choa of span and sakti are the same Also, uh, we have uh, another questions about um, local government choa and uh, central government choa is the same or different. Uh, we have uh, central government choa that is implemented for all line ministries. And on the other side, we also have a local government choa uh, uh, that is different from central government, but uh, it is set uh, harmonized to central government choa because we also uh, we also produce financial government consolidation between the central government financial report and local government financial report uh, on context of uh, accounting and GFS. And the third question is about uh, how long Indonesia uh, need to improve the IT uh, respond to uh, COVID-19 Jawa. Uh, uh, can it explain uh, that uh, we need uh, not too long, maybe about uh, two until three weeks for um, update the choa to span and sakti because we have a uh, set of uh, IT for uh, all all budget cycle starting starting from uh, planning and then. Uh, budget execution and uh, financial reporting. So uh, we just need to uh, to, yeah, yeah. to adjust to adjust uh, choa or uh, I mean uh, special choa for COVID-19 into the IT. I think it's uh, my explanation about three questions for Indonesia. Maybe my colleague uh, Rahmat uh, can give more explanation in detail about the third question. Please, Rahmat. Okay. Thank you, Bu uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want, uh, want to have uh, some additional information. That is, uh, maybe uh, the setting for the updated CHOA in our IT system is not quite long enough because uh, it's already uh, only to update the reference code, which uh, code is should be updated. Is it the output, uh, activity, accounts, or might be another uh, different segment of CHOA, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, the 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 one that takes it too long is uh, the decision, the decision of the business process, yeah, of the business process itself that uh, can be make uh, longer in decision making. After that, then we can use it uh, as a a set of uh, special code in a uh, certain segment of CHOA. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Indonesia. I think that's a good segue also then for the next session, which will look a bit more 
in detail about uh, IT systems and how IT systems can help uh, with this reporting uh, lead. But um, so wait, let let me uh, thank all the presenters uh, for this very rich um, discussion and inputs during in today's session, uh, where we run four minutes uh, over time. But uh, I think that's okay. We can you will still get your five minute break and we'll have a less uh, dense session uh, thereafter. And just one last point before I let you go, is uh, we're still looking for a volunteer to share your takeaways uh, at the wrap-up for this session and for the next session. Uh, so please uh, volunteer through the chat box, uh, chat box uh, as we will need to identify a volunteer. Thank you, and let's reconnect in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Are we ready to start our second session? Let's see if the camera go, go, go on. That would be a sign of readiness. Vietnam is ready. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Myanmar. Jim definitely is ready and it's been ready for two hours. Hi, Fabian. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jim. So then let's, let's, let's give ourselves uh, two more minutes so that everyone can reconnect. But I see in the meantime the chat continues, so that's, that's great. That's something we cannot really do in a face to face uh, meeting. And we'll definitely share also the presentation and uh, underpinning material. Okay, let me let me check with uh, the chair, Mrs. Tui. Sh should we start or Vietnam? Miss, Mrs. Tui, sh should we start the second session? And we're still looking for volunteers, basically, for the wrap up. It's, uh, it's just a simple sharing of takeaways, and we're happy to share the notes with the volunteers. If we don't get volunteers, we'll have to call on the presenters of the respective sessions, the country presenters. Okay, so in the interest of time, and this will, we will reconnect with our VCOP uh, colleagues uh, in an hour. So let's uh, start this session. So the second session will focus on the agility of treasuries in their responses to the crisis, the lessons learned uh, from that, both in terms of treasury information system. We saw in the chat that there have been quite a lot of questions about how, uh, how to adapt and how long it takes to adapt information systems to ensure systematic uh, and, and, and clean reporting. Uh, of taking into account uh, the different levels of government, uh, the netting out, uh, but also how treasuries responded in terms of cash management, commitment controls, financing, uh, borrowing. I mean, this, this unprecedented fiscal impact really required lots of resources, had an impact, a substantial impact on the revenue side as well as on the expenditure side both in terms of volume, but also re massive reallocations, as we saw yesterday, and I think we'll learn a bit more uh, today. So we, again, have a very substantive panel. Uh, I really feel blessed, and thank you very much uh, for your participation. We have uh, Jim Denner and, um, and his uh, colleague from Deep Brain. Um, so Jim Denner, I, mean, I, I don't even know if I need to present you, Jim. I'm sh uh, everyone knows you here. You're really part of the family uh, for a while now. So Jem is our global lead for digital governance. And he supported IFMISES in over 50 countries over two decades. So if there's any issue with an IFMIS, it's because of Jem. Uh, but if it makes your life easier, it's also thanks to him. 
uh, two decades. I don't ask his age, but uh, lots of, info of wealth of experience uh, and expertise here. So thank you very much uh, for joining us, Jem. Uh, we'll also have a joint presentation with Mr. Ki Young Lee, manager at the Korean Public Finance Information um, Center, and also a brain behind the brain. And I think recently there has been a very interesting presentation on the new generation of deep brain and its capabilities. And I think it all makes us dream about what it can do for us. But hopefully there will be very useful takeaways also for the ISMIS reforms and adaptation we are uh, uh, currently undergoing. Uh, then we'll have a presentation by Mr. Eduardo Marino, Director of Asset Management at the Treasury of the Philippines and TCOP veteran. Uh, I think you, he, should, he deserves the prize of the most prolific presenter at TCOP, um, and also yesterday the plenary, very, very interesting presentation. And so today we can go a bit deeper in terms of uh, the cash management and financing responses. And then we'll have a presentation by Mrs. Uh, Yuen Etienne Gokyu, um, who has recently been promoted uh, Deputy Director for Cash Management at the Vietnam Treasury. Uh, congratulations, and worked also on PubMed, so the information system underpinning that. And she'll give us a, a presentation about how Vietnam not only uh, managed the virus, but also managed the cash uh, and, and the debt management, and actually took advantage of this crisis uh, to uh, foster reforms, uh, speed up the reforms. Uh, so without further ado, um, and apologies again that I'll need uh, to enforce time so, Jim, since your presentation is a joint presentation, uh, two presenters uh, will give you 15 minutes. All other presenters, please keep it to 10 minutes so that we do have time for discussion. Uh, the floor is yours, Jim. Thank you so much, uh, Fabian. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks for inviting me uh, to this useful discussion. Let me share my screen uh, very quickly and then uh, start the presentation, and I hope you can all uh, see me now. Uh, see my screen now. This okay. is a short presentation. Thank you. This is a short presentation, uh, as you requested, just to uh, discuss how uh, treasury systems can be more resilient and agile, uh, considering the um, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, coronavirus pandemic, and the challenges we are dealing with. Uh, since March. As you know very well, uh, at the early stages of this crisis, all institutions developed uh, guidance notes, uh, policy advice, and even some portals uh, to track the policy decisions impact or, on treasury operations or other parts of the government operations. And the World Bank uh, actually contributed to this effort with several guidelines and even a COVID-19 policy checking portal, as some of you may know. And eventually there were some blog posts and guidance notes published. You can see the links to uh, these uh, resources at the bottom of the screen, but the main idea was um, these were published in April 2020. And they all highlighted several key aspects. Among these, I picked the ones uh, perhaps relevant to this discussion and wanted to share with you in this slide. Um, we all realize that um, most of the countries are trying to go virtual to ensure business continuity. That was the first observation. Second, they were trying to find ways, and I will share one of the fine examples uh, during the slides, to change their habits and try to move to a different mode of operation to track COVID expenditure and then uh, provide support for emergency responses. Also, uh, they definitely paid attention to keep audit trail in place so that they can track what is happening with the flow of funds. And finally, they decided to use technology in a different way. Uh, and some countries start uh, thinking about moving to cloud. Some uh, start developing mechanisms to provide remote connectivity for their systems if they haven't done so. So many things came up with different ideas. All of these boil down to the key point that the, uh, they should really consider GovTech innovations. And I will, in a short while, explain very briefly what we mean by GovTech uh, to change the habits, to change the culture, and start moving to 
digital solutions as fast as possible to really uh, create more resilient and agile treasury systems. Um, what we mean by GovTech? Um, GovTech may have a lot of different definitions for different uh, countries from different perspectives. For, from the World Bank perspective, we defined it, as you can see here, as a whole of government approach to public sector modernization. And we think that it promotes simple, efficient, it should promote pro simple, efficient and transparent government with a citizen at the center of reforms. We are emphasizing three aspects uh, from the World Bank uh, perspective. Uh, the whole of government approach to digital transformation may be inspirational at this stage, but this should be really the center focus of attention while you are investing on digital solutions in the near future. Also, when we are designing citizen-centric services, it's a very common word, we should also focus on universally accessible services, meaning that uh, not only wonderful portals, but the services should be accessible to all levels of the uh, society, uh, poor people, uh, remote sites, through mobile, through other channels, citizen service, there should be plenty of service delivery channels to enhance access to services, universal access to services for different layers of the society. Also, uh, we are hoping that these kind of initiatives should focus on improving the efficiency, transparency, and accountability of the government by promoting civic tech, uh, citizen engagement, etc. And there are other agenda items in GovTech. Uh, use of disruptive technology is a part of the agenda, definitely, but this is not the only one uh, when we talk about GovTech. So GovTech is not high tech only. It is a lot of other things that complement the technology. Plus, public data platforms, how to share public data to promote the value and uh, um, support individuals and firms to do innovative solutions. Also, how to support local economy, local firms to create GovTech ecosystems, uh, start through startups and local entrepreneurs. And finally, how to promote public-private partnership in this regard to bring private sector expertise to address public sector challenges. Um, very quickly, uh, GovTech is really, uh, in a sense, new frontier of digital government transformation. And many of you are going through this cycle at different stages in different countries. So. It, 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 since 2005, I think we are seeing more focus on digital government, more advanced level of automation, connectivity, government as a platform. But the next frontier is really, can we focus on specific areas and uh, produce meaningful results in a short time, to not to wait for years to get a huge transformation in many countries? And again, from the World Bank perspective, we are focused on four areas, four main areas through our investments, advisory support, funding for some time. Uh, and these are, again, user-centric service delivery, um, providing universal accessibility, and modernization of core government systems. These are, uh, obviously, FMIS is a part of it, Treasury systems is a part of it, but we are saying that in the next modernization cycle, please consider holistically. Try to link your treasury system as much, as much as possible to other systems using shared platforms and much benefit of IT investments. Also, we are suggesting that uh, we should focus on citizen engagement, a citizen feedback mechanism, performance monitoring mechanism, complaint handling mechanism to complement the service delivery channels. And finally, we shouldn't lose focus from um, GovTech enablers. These are critical uh, agenda items like improving digital skills, um, appropriate and conducive legal and regulatory regimes, strong enabling and safeguarding institutions. This is very critical, as you know, strengthening audit side and then oversight, cybersecurity in the digital sense is very important. And finally, uh, supporting public sector innovation. Um, this is a, a typical uh, layout that I am using in many presentations to highlight the importance of integrated digital solutions. Any country that currently having a setup similar to this picture, uh, really passed with flying colors from the COVID crisis because they were ready uh, for many things. If a treasury system is not well connected, is not accessible securely uh, for different users, is not internally connected to other systems like payment systems, procurement, etc. 
uh, obviously you may suffer in times of a in, in in case of a crisis. This is exactly what happened in many countries. Uh, I think most of us learned our lessons. Some of us were more ready, and they managed to switch to a different mode of operation in a very short time, a few months, and then survive. Um, finally, uh, the crisis demonstrated that uh, GovTech solutions play a critical role. Um, there is more emphasis now to ensure business continuity. Many countries are definitely more interested in enhancing uh, disaster recovery centers. They are uh, uh, putting some arrangements to support emergency operations, remote access, and there are some innovative solutions coming up, which I will share very briefly in the next slide. And finally, they are getting ready for the post-pandemic environment, meaning that they are thinking differently now in their strategy document, revising their digital government strategies and um, focusing more on cost-effective long-term solutions. Now, one of the key examples that I would like to share to conclude my session is from North Macedonia. Um, when the pandemic appeared in March, uh, there was an urgent need to support businesses. And then uh, the government suddenly came up with an idea uh, to use some of the funds of an existing World Bank project, which is possible, by the way. So uh, they picked a local roads connectivity project and said to the bank, can we use a certain part for emergency response? And we uh, made a very quick assessment. It took less than uh, two weeks to look at the country systems, okay, and come up with a solution uh, to convert them to very easy to use channels to receive the applications, to process the applications, and then to channel funds to beneficiaries, all automated fashion, and make it highly transparent online, including a complaint mechanism. So it took less than two months for the Ministry of Finance, uh, tax office, central bank, and several other government agencies to combine the forces and they, without spending any money, just the existing IT units, existing setup, they just deployed their IT teams, they just extended existing tax portal uh, by putting an application form, they linked this system already uh, to treasury and banking, they enhanced linkages, and what happened, it, after a month or two, they start paying um, monthly allocations to about 11,000 selected companies uh, covering nearly 7,000 employees of these companies every month. And since then, they also made a very smart decision to develop a portal. Uh, the bottom uh, right corner is showing you the COVID-19 fiscal transparency portal. So they are disclosing every single payment transaction made to the beneficiaries through this portal, and they are responding to the feedback. I think this kind of solutions, uh, as we can see, can be developed in a very short time if the country is substantially ready and there is a high level of commitment and focus to convert the existing platforms to uh, support emergency needs effectively, cost effectively. The last slide I will stop here uh, is a presentation that will be the continuation of my uh, talk uh, from Mr. Kiong Lee, uh, KPFIS. Before moving to his speech, let me just uh, spend 15 seconds to show you that there are two publicly um, available GovTech briefs. You can download them now from the links below, and there are two websites that you may wish to visit, internal, external, to get more information about GovTech if needed. So thank you very much for your attention, and let me turn the, give the floor to Mr. Kiong Lee for his talk on the KPFAS responses. Kiong? Yes, thank you, Sam. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kiyong Lee, in charge of international cooperation in KFAPS. And first of all, I'm so impressed and to participate in this seminar and then to introduce the COVID-19 responding for D-Brain operation. KPAPIS is a learning of financial management information system, what is called the D-Brain. From now on, I will explain how KPAPIS responds to COVID-19 from the operator's pointers of view regarding deep brain operation. KPFIS quickly established the distrib distributed work environment in the early stage of COVID-19 outbreak and deployed some of the key operation personnel to the distributed work area. So even if the office was closed due to a confirmed case in the office, 
there is a no delay or interruption of the national financial task because we establish a district work environment. The different system operates within the national network and is physically located in the National Information Research Service. The Kruvia service, Kruvia system operates within the information sources internal network and physically located at the head of office service station. As most Korean government and public institution manage their internal networks, network separately from external network and remote access, it is strict, strictly controlled. The technical environment related to remote operation in district workplace is as follows. First, in order to use our Groovell, we have established a section encryption communication environment between the distributed work site, watch on, and the main office substation to prevent external data viewing or set of deorganization. Second, for the operation of the different system in the distributed workplace, we secure the same access authority as the head of office through quick business consultant and install encryption equipment to establish an environment direct access to the national intelligence service. There are environments where we can perform all tasks such as administrative and system operation in the distrib distributed workplace as we did in the head of in the head office. And we are actually working with many objectors. In addition, KPFIS has established an environment in which we can work at our home in addition to the distributed work area. And the administrative work using our group is the same as the distributed workplace, but there is a difference from the operation of the different system. As described earlier, the different system operates within the within the national network and is operated by the National Information Research Service Station. Distributed work site granted access to the national national network as an operating organization, but cannot be accessed from each individual's home. Therefore, the officer who is working at home installed the GVPN to access the national network and only implemented an environment where they could access the different portal screen. Telecommunicators cannot directly access a server or database to perform their operation, but they perform limited tasks such as checking the normally of a different service, checking and the process user inquires. So far, it's the, it's the COVID-19 the COVID uh, dispense for different operating. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Mr. Lee uh, and, and Jem uh, for, for this uh, very rich presentation. Uh, maybe Jem, what would be useful is also to share uh, the full presentation you have on, on D-Brain. You organized recently a reveal in the chat box, so a colleague uh, wants more details than can have it. Uh, what I love with your presentation, I have so many hyperlinks and other resources that it's really a, a to-go place, uh, uh, but that, that's great. I think, thank you for sharing the 10 other ways surgeries can respond uh, to COVID. Indeed, there have been a few uh, policy notes on that, and we saw also in the country examples, and how technology can help. Uh, your example of Macedonia is very insightful, uh, and Korea, and notably how to ensure business continuity, distributed work, telecommuting. It's true that surgeries were uh, disrupted as anyone else uh, by the uh, by the public uh, public safety response to COVID, uh, while they ever needed them, right? So uh, the information system really helped ensure this business continuity, working from home, uh, while responding to all all the needs. Uh, so that's very useful. Let me now move on to uh, our second presenter, Mr. Marino, uh, who had a very good presentation yesterday already on on the impact. Uh, the fiscal impact of COVID in the Philippines and uh, how his good relationships with the central bank and its has helped overcome the cash crunch. But uh, over to you uh, in these 10 minutes uh, so we can discuss. In the meantime, 
uh, colleagues, if you have questions, please use the chat box, and I would encourage Carla to chat. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Fabian. Uh, good morning, everyone. So once again, I make a presentation regarding the uh, well, Philippine experience, specifically the Treasury experience during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So how we'd like to uh, show you how we responded in these very trying times. So, okay, I think the most important, actually, this is the godsend uh, uh, framework that we have is the Treasury Single Account Framework. So specifically, uh, the, the, because we have already implemented the TSA in the past, we, have, uh, we were in a position to take a full advantage of the framework. So in the part uh, on revenues, the uh, one, the T plus one uh, protocol, meaning uh, one business day after uh, the banks receive the collection, they need to remit that to the uh, treasury. That uh, protocol has been uh, strictly followed and it has uh, substantially benefited our cash management application because uh, from the, uh, in, before we implement the TSA, can you just imagine that the banks can keep the money that they collected for a few days? At, uh, I have seen uh, instances where they kept the money they received for more than 10 days. So just imagine how much, if we had not uh, switched to the TSA, how much havoc that's going to lead to our uh, cash flow forecasting and cash management operations. Now, because we receive the what little revenues we can get uh, as soon as possible, it also reduced the uh, short-term borrowing uh, pressure. So we did not need to, we were not at the mercy of uh, the markets who come the uh, COVID-19 uh, response. The second uh, benefit of the TSA framework is on the disbursement part. So of course, we are still in the process of uh, implementing the IFMIS, and right now we are not even uh, completely centralized. We are, uh, we are basically uh, outsourcing our disbursements through the use of through three government servicing banks. So what's happening is that we give them the money and then uh, all of the agencies, all of the line ministries who need the uh, to pay their creditors or suppliers and just need to process it or uh, work with the government servicing banks. Now, that's not ideal, but uh, that's what we have. And uh, at the very least, though, uh, funds are ultimately sourced from the TSA. So we are not giving money to the line ministries, to the specific line ministries' bank accounts to implement their own project. It's still, uh, there's still some uh, control and oversight on uh, on the uh, disbursement side. Now, the we don't we, uh, because of the decentralized nature of the disbursement system, we are not in a position to get uh, detailed, uh, disaggregated, specific information on each disbursement uh, made by line ministries. But I think in terms of cash management, the most important data you need is really the aggregate disbursement. So. You don't know if you, it's more important for cash management to know that, uh, let's say, $5 billion was spent on a single day rather than knowing uh, the uh, specific uh, uh, components of those uh, disbursements. So we just need, uh, it's a matter of prioritization. So in this case, uh, it was good enough for us to conduct our cash management operations. Now, the other, uh, the other part of our um, approach towards a crisis is that for the longest time, it has always been a treasury policy to maintain substantial cash buffer. Now, this is not, well, it's not uh, prohibitively expensive, but it's non-negligible. The costs are non-negligible, so much so that for every, uh, whenever uh, the IMF uh, goes to the Philippines, it's one of the things that uh, they flag to us, so they say that the uh, massive cash balances we're keeping is uh, generating, uh, well, non-negligible fiscal costs. So the issue really for us is that uh, it enables us to wait until markets come down before borrowing. So uh, again, when the crisis hit the country around March, just look at the uh, look at the spike in the government bond yields. So. Can you just imagine uh, if we did not have the huge cash buffer to tide us over, we are going to be forced to borrow at these exorbitantly high interest rates. And um, if markets see that, if uh, people see that uh, the government is running out of cash in this emergency, then panic is likely to spread and it will make the situation worse. So 
and no matter how good your cash flow forecasting is, uh, I think the crisis just uh, the, it's, it will never be good enough to handle this crisis. So, for example, in the Philippines, expenditures were pretty much double uh, the uh, revenue intake for the uh, months of April and May. No amount of uh, sophisticated cash flow forecasting techniques is going to prepare you for that. So you really need the only thing that will uh, prepare you for that is a huge cash buffer. So of course there's cost to that, but from our point of view, uh, worrying about that cost is uh, a tantamount to uh, being a uh, penny wise but pound foolish. So basically we feel that uh, that's being too. Uh, concerned about relatively small costs, but ignoring the substantial cost of uh, failing to provide enough cash. Now, of course, since uh, revenues are down, it was really important that we uh, maximize our fundraising opportunities. So first, the important thing is that uh, we had to capitalize on uh, market opportunities when they present themselves. So that means constant monitoring and more important, swift execution of debt transactions. This is very important for our uh, foreign issuance. So when we see on a single day that the markets are going, that are not are as good as it can be, then uh, what we can price and then set uh, execute the transaction in that same day. So uh, we have already our we have. Uh, the institutional knowledge and the uh, operational expertise to do that. Then we have what we call for domestic uh, securities, we have what we call uh, a TAP facility. So basically, this is a facility to absorb excess auction demand. So uh, what happens is when the auctions are not good enough to absorb everything, then we open this uh, facility so uh, banks, financial institutions can get more, uh, can get the securities they need. Uh, at the, of course, the same price of the auction. Then we also did uh, a variety of uh, debt exchanges. So the benefit of the debt exchanges is that we, uh, we, we economize on our cash resources. So rather than paying uh, our creditors with cash, hard cash, which we need to for the COVID response, we uh, paid them with uh, a debt with uh, government securities that will mature in the future. So that's uh, pretty important because again, in this environment, cash is king. Uh, of course, all of this can only be done because we have uh, invested a lot in our staff capacity. So these people know all of the institutional, uh, uh, potential institutional uh, choke points, uh, how to work around them. And more importantly, they can uh, sift through the, uh, um, the uh, what I call the, um, well, the flattery of the, uh, banks who will underwrite of our uh, debt uh, operations. So, and then of course, in addition to the usual uh, uh, fundraising, uh, um, fundraising uh, activities, we have what we call, uh, well, we, we, did we did tap unconventional funding sources. So the most important of which is the central bank uh, advances that we had. So it was er earlier, it was a repo format. 300 billion pesos, and uh, at the latter part of this year, we we upsized that to make it 540 billion. We also initiated what we call a, uh, a cash sweep of uh, bank balances outside the TSA. So while we have the more or less a TSA framework in place, it's still imperfect because there's still huge cash balances outside the, uh, the TSA. So we have tried to initiate a partial sweep of those balances to fund our COVID response. And uh, finally, in terms of getting the cash or uh, resources, generating resources, we uh, try to leverage uh, existing fintech solutions. So for example, we have what this uh, application called the bonds that PH that allows retail investors to invest whenever we issue new retail treasury bonds. We also wanted to facilitate the implementation of uh, online production systems for the line agency. So uh, these are the regulatory fees, these are the licensing fees. So uh, as much as possible, we encourage uh, the uh, agencies to utilize the uh, existing uh, service providers and make sure that their arrangement is still compliant with the ESA framework because it is pointless to get the, to implement these solutions where, but you know, uh, the service providers uh, retain the money for a long period of time. So it has to be, everything has to be within the DSA framework. 
Now, the um, other thing is that the, the, the pandemic uh, forced us to uh, uh, what you call generate very creative uh, policy responses. So I met this. This is a point uh, I mentioned uh, yesterday's presentation. But this is the very hard constraint when it comes to uh, our stimulus program. So there, um, that is why the, our budget and management department, uh, when they devised the stimulus package, they had to rely substantially rely on uh, realignments uh, uh, fit, uh, within the 2020 uh, budget. So that because of this approbation, but nonetheless, we tried to uh, we tried to do our best under these constraints. So for example. Uh, it mentioned here corresponding revenue uh, proposed therein. So the revenue of, for tax, of course, is not forthcoming. So we did uh, what we call number one. We did, we uh, aggressively we used we uh, afforded ourselves an aggressive use of uh, moral suasion to our um, state-owned enterprises for them to deliver. Uh, dividends, record-breaking dividends, to help us uh, comply with these uh, provisions. The uh, the market, as you can saw, you see earlier, the market, the domain, uh, capital market, specifically the bond market, uh, saw a reduction in yields, substantial reduction in yields. And what that mean meant for us was that there was numerous trading opportunities where in. Uh, we can increase the income from investment operations. And part of that was used to support new appropriations bill. And uh, for, and then finally, a portion of the uh, cash sweep we have done, we were able to uh, get the agencies, the nine agencies who, kept, who had them, to give them up, to just give it to the national government for, uh, again, COVID use. So those are some of the things we did to, uh, um, uh, to basically see at the limits of this uh, provision. Now, the, this one is going to be a little bit uh, controversial because uh, right now the Philippines really problem the Philippines that we are not we are still in the process of implementing the this. So there's still a lot of uh, manual operations going on. And what what happened was that uh, when the crisis hit, when everybody needed to make sure everything goes right, well, they all decided we. Be including us, the Treasury, we all decided to stop implementing our uh, IFMIS and go back to uh, the, the uh, traditional way of doing things. And there are uh, reasons for that. So, for example, the problem really for IFMIS, at least the transition to IFMIS, is that it entails substantial, a very steep learning curve. Now it's really not the time to be making mistakes, to be learning from mistakes. And um, the existing processes, the manual as they are, still provides a common language across the entire bureaucracy. And really, this is important because what we're doing is we're working, not uh, uh, we are working with the thousands upon thousands of time uh, ministries to uh, address the COVID uh, pandemic. So, uh, piecemeal implementation of the IFMIS is not going to work here because. And you have people who don't, uh, who still are not used to the IFMIS or who, who haven't even heard of the IFMIS since being uh, steadily rolled out. Second issue is that uh, the IFMIS itself is uh, there's really inherent inflexibility there. So the benefits of IFMIS transparency, uh, 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 fast uh, reporting, and the ease of generating the monitoring and reporting requirements. This is accomplished by a, a, a significant amount of a standardization. So you standardize the operation, all the documentary requirements, and your relevant uh, posts. Uh, the problem is in this environment, you have to loosen all some of those documentary requirements if you want to get things done. And then uh, an IFMIS cannot allow, at least it's very difficult for the IFMIS to adjust to these difficult uh, circumstances. Now, uh, because the existing regulations, there is a room for flexibility there. And uh, with the IFMIS, it removes that uh, ability to maximize those existing uh, flexibility, at least from our experience. And finally, the IFMIS is really designed based on best practices. Now, in 2021, we have two appropriations, budgetary appropriations. So we're going to continue our 2020 appropriations and we have passed a new 2021 appropriations. So I don't think there's an if miss that uh, already contemplates as the default 
to uh, ongoing uh, budgetary appropriations for uh, fiscal year. So um, again, manual operations can handle that. DIPMIS can handle this, but requires a lot of handling procedures. That's why, at least in this crisis, everybody uh, stopped implementing the DIPMIS. We hope to return to that after everything has come down, but that was the lesson we learned in this crisis. Now, for the 2021 plan. Sorry, Eduardo, we'll need to conclude. Uh, yes. We have a hard constraint uh, right after. Thank you. Sure. Uh, just a few. So, I think the point here is that uh, while um, well, there was, there is still really a need for a fiscal consolidation. So, we have to make sure that uh, in the next coming years, we, we produce a uh, well, we, we produce a plan, a very uh, convincing plan that we are in the path for fiscal consolidation. Otherwise, it's going to uh, be bad for us, We're going to have a lot of difficult times. So in terms of fiscal consolidation, we want to re uh, steadily reduce our deficit. We want to uh, at least uh, flatten the uh, pace of uh, debt growth as much as possible. And we want to rely as much as possible on the, in using a domestic uh, financing sources. And, uh, but for ultimately for everything we do, uh, the one uh, crucial factor when it comes to maintaining sustainability is really economic growth. So we can uh, do what we can, but if economic growth will not return, then uh, the measures will not be enough. So that's the takeaway here. Uh, sustainability is really primarily a function of uh, growth. So that's, what, uh, that's why hence the need for the fiscal stimulus in the first place. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, and, and sorry, a bit pressed for time, but uh, great takeaways that really uh, the TSA was, was extremely helpful uh, for managing this unprecedented cash crunch. A 200 billion mismatch between revenue and expenditures in May, if that's what I understood from your slide. How you used also FinTech and innovation, uh, bonds.ph. Uh, for instance, uh, for the retail. Uh, we took note of the inflexibility of IFMIS. I'm sure Jem also took note of that. Uh, <laughs> we we'll can have further sessions on that. But indeed, uh, how to have agile systems. Uh, and your last point, which you also mentioned yesterday, is how COVID has wiped out in six months your 10 years of effort of fiscal consolidation, uh, that it will take time uh, to, to get back there because we need growth. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, let me maybe turn to the last presenter, uh, last but certainly not least, Vietnam. Uh, Mrs. Hsu, if you can kindly share Vietnam's experience in uh, cash and debt management in the midst of COVID. Uh, but please keep it uh, to 10 minutes because we have a very hard constraint, uh, less time than cash even. Um, so <laughs> no need to go through the 13 slides, maybe just a few key slides. Everyone has seen the presentations and has read them, I assume. And in the meantime, colleagues, uh, please continue posing your question and your chat uh, in the chat box, since we won't have much time to discuss. Thank you. Over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my presentation includes a two parts. Oh, thế nào đang bật ý nhỉ? I would like to focus on the key points of my presentation. Em đợi một chút. Có nội dung không nhỉ? Hello again. Yeah, uh, I feel that the echo. But cái nào em đừng có xử lý cái đấy nếu tí nữa nó lại hỏng thì. Hello again. Ah, it's much better now. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to present to you uh, our experiences in uh, issuing government bond 
Uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, uh, which affects significantly the government revenue and expenditure, that's why the fund uh, mobilization has been also adjusted in order to uh, take into account the uh, fiscal deficit. The challenges for the state treasury of Vietnam is to adjust the decision to adjust the budget was issued in November when the National Assembly approves the uh, decision to uh, finance the fiscal deficit in 2020. However, as we observe the revenue and expenditure closely, so the State Treasury of Vietnam has uh, been able to uh, project for the uh, additional uh, budget mobilization, fund mobilization. And in uh, November, we have uh, basically uh, uh, completed 100% uh, of our fund mobilization or fundraising uh, target at the beginning of the year. And in uh, December, we'll also uh, add, uh, raise more, uh, raise about 10% more uh, compared to the target set at the beginning of the year. We conduct the periodical, uh, the weekly auction in the uh, security market on Wednesday uh, through the e-auction system. And uh, basically the, the procedure and the processes are simple. Uh, up to the 15th of no, uh, December, we have uh, completed 95% uh, of the revenue the tenor, uh, the average tenor of our bonds is uh, 5 to uh, 30 years. And in 2020, the uh, average tenor uh, of our portfolio is nearly 14 years. While the average rate is 2.88% per year. And we have an illustration of the uh, uh, results of bond issuance in the recent five years. And you can see that uh, there has been improvement in terms of the uh, uh, average uh, maturity. And we uh, share the same experiences like uh, Philippines. Uh, because of the TSA, uh, the uh, uh, state uh, uh, cash, uh, the cash of the government has, you know, uh, assisted uh, substantially uh, the borrowing of the government. There are times that the market rate increased so high. We uh, postponed the issuance of the government bond and we wait until uh, the time that the market can get back to normal. In terms of cash management, uh, currently uh, we have uh, uh, introduced the leg uh, legal and regulatory system uh, that guide our cash management practices. Currently, the State Treasury of Vietnam uh, has uh, implemented and completed our TSA. And at the end of the day, all of the uh, cash is centralized at the State Treasury. And this is uh, the cash that can meet adequately the government expenditure requirements at all time. Uh, we conduct uh, the regular uh, cash projection and forecasting to adjust the uh, uh, cash plan according to our actual requirements and needs. We also uh, developed the quarterly cash management plan and options. And uh, we uh, followed uh, the options that uh, uh, is approved by the MOF. Uh, the cash is essential. Yeah. We have uh, the idle cash. 
And uh, we have invested uh, these uh, idle cash efficiently. The, the through investment, the cash management uh, helps to uh, contribute uh, to revenue uh, collection, uh, like in the case of Philippines. In addition, we also use cash for, uh, you know, uh, we lend to the central state budget, uh, why the central state budget cannot uh, mobilize from uh, their uh, channels. So with the uh, cash investment operations, we should replace the deposits in the commercial banks uh, through e-auctioning. And uh, for the year 2021, uh, we uh, plan to, to carry out uh, government bond repo transactions in order to diversify the investments of the idle cash and to uh, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of cash management. So basically, our cash management has been uh, gradually uh, electronicalized. In the coming uh, time, we will make electronic uh, uh, all of our cash management operations and to, uh, uh, you know, uh, combine it uh, effectively uh, with the state uh, budget management through uh, bond is issuance. So just to share with you briefly our experiences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation and very efficient. Uh, so it's, I, I really note uh, the the very important impact of COVID on public finances in Vietnam, uh, revenues down 12.5%, uh, expenditures uh, reduced a little bit, but uh, uh, luckily you, you did have some cash buffers, but also uh, the increased uh, need of financing has, has been done using technology, e-auction, e-banking, as we also saw in the Philippines. And I particularly note, uh, I mean, my main, main takeaway of the Vietnam presentation is that um, you have really used this crisis to accelerate reforms, uh, accelerate reforms in terms of more proactive debt management, of more integrated cash budget and debt management, and so that is really a, a great, uh, great news and inspiration. Uh, so thank, thank you for that. We have, I think we can take five more minutes. We have a 10-minute buffer. This session ends in two minutes, but uh, let's take five more minutes uh, before we then regroup um, under the BCOP. So please uh, then after after five minutes, uh, join the, uh, the WebEx under BCOP. And uh, I'm not sure we have received volunteers uh, to share the takeaways in the next session. So let us volunteer the, the speakers during these, uh, these kick-up sessions. So we'd like to invite Indonesia and Malaysia to share their two-minute takeaways uh, later for the session one and the Philippines and Vietnam to share their main takeaways two minutes uh, at the wrap-up. Uh, so in the meantime, if there are any further questions, I see in the chat most questions have already been answered. But if there are any further questions, uh, please let us know. Uh, sorry, there, there is... Uh, Okay. Okay, so just a few clarifications on the angle on the business. So basically, the if misses with, uh, for the Philippines is the EMS, and that requires people. So when I say stop, people basically people are not uh, if, uh, uploading their transactions and are not encoding the transactions in the EMS. They are using the manual uh, operations to uh, execute the budget. So that's what it means when you say, uh, when I said that uh, uh, if miss is stopped. So we, instead of encoding it within the if miss our transactions, we are basically uh, going to defer the uh, encoding in the first place. So it's not, uh, again, rollout is still ongoing, but stop really means we're no longer encoding it. So that's uh, the first point. The second one is on the 
uh, record and reconcile of the revenues for D plus one. So um, actually, this is one of the uh, uh, issues. So the recording really is based on the uh, collection as rec date as reckoned recon by our uh, well revenue agency. So they will, if they in their books, uh, they have recognized the collection. Let's say on December twenty eighth. Uh, then that's the official uh, record of the government. But the problem is we're talking about cash here. So in terms of cash, of course, there's going to be some, uh, um, well, there's going to be some uh, discrepancy there, but that's just on the timing of uh, receipts. So um, yeah, so this, so we're mostly, in terms of accounting, we are mostly cash, but with some modifications. So for example, uh, that, point on the uh, recognition of collection. So we, our accounting books uh, follow the collecting agency, not on the timing of the uh, cash. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, there was also a question regarding how you, how you manage multi-annual commitments uh, uh, through FMS. Uh, multi-annual commitment. So, um, well, first of all, the uh, controls, uh, disbursement controls for those multi-annual commitments are automatically coming from uh, DBM. But uh, in our experience, uh, it's well, the process is well handled. So, the, we uh, the actually a lot of the uh, uh, things we are funding right now are um, what you call accounts payable. So, basically, uh, it has been these are. This has been, uh, these are commitments uh, made before, but had uh, already uh, uh, well, rolled over at the next fiscal year. So there's really no issue. We just need to, once we, once the agencies, like agencies provide us with the uh, disbursement authority they got from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, our DPM, then we give the money to the banks and, you know, the banks will be the one responsible to pay the, Creditors or suppliers. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, any other comments, questions on on cash management, debt management, but also on the earlier presentation we had on IFMIS uh, and DBrain. So we we just got an extra ten minutes. Uh, the wrap up has been postponed by ten minutes. Um, so that's great. Uh, Time seems to be as fungible as cash. Uh, so that seems to have a question, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to come back to one of the issues that we were discussing yesterday, uh, and, and one issue will be discussed today, of course. <clears throat> yesterday, we were talking about uh, uh, when Korea was making their presentation and other countries had intervened about trying to do things which are, you know, having the constraints or having the traditional constraints of not borrowing from the central bank and that sort of thing to deal with the crisis. Uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, it is good to think outside the box in a crisis, but we should also be careful that we do not loosen the rules so much that they, the whole process gets vitiated once the crisis is over. So maybe if countries are thinking of relaxing their, say, the fiscal rules or and things like that, it may be good to have do so with a sunset clause, that in two years, this will no longer be operated. Uh, the other point, of course, uh, is about the FMIS thing, and uh, I'm seeing these questions from Philippines about having, uh, having stopped or, or sort of held in abeyance the implementation of the FMIs, and that would be another issue, I think, in many countries in the time of crisis. So how do we plan to deal with that issue? I mean, uh, there are two things here. If you delay things too much, you lose traction and you lose momentum. But during the crisis, it may be difficult to implement them with the same intensity as you would in normal times. So how do we achieve this balance? And maybe Chem can uh, speak on that. <laughs> uh, Suhash, uh, can you please uh, repeat your last sentence? I am not hearing the sound for some reason very clearly. 
Okay, let me go on my side. Yeah, let me go closer. My question, my this thing was that, you know, in times of crisis, uh, we may not be able to implement things with the same intensity as we would in normal times. On the other hand, if we hold, if we stop things or we hold them in abeyance, we may lose momentum, and then getting back to the same thing may take far longer than it normally would. So, how do we? In this crisis, how do we achieve a balance between slowing things down, not, but not losing momentum either, but still getting things done? Maybe, maybe instead of six months, it would take one year. But how do we keep things rolling? How do we keep attraction going? That's all. Yeah, thank you very much. I can obviously share my limited experience in uh, several countries since March. I am sure other co uh, colleague countries have different experiences, but I have seen really a mixture of uh, options and um, consequences uh, in this uh, period within the last nine months. In some countries like Korea, for example, um, on the technology side, the shift to an alternative mode of working was not difficult. And since the system was already robust, established, and very well linked to many other things. I mean, they didn't really loosen the controls and they kept on doing the similar things with the similar oversight, uh, transparency. I mean, it was business as usual. I mean, it was already established. It, they just switched on to another mode of working. In some other countries, they struggled, obviously. I mean, they tried to weigh different ways, especially in the Africa region uh, that I am working with. They had extremely difficult I and mean, everything is paper-based. Most of them are telling, despite IFMIS, okay, you still need to find the officials to sign the documents produced from IFMIS. It was like mission impossible. We tried to help them to connect remotely, VPN connections. We uh, gave them advice, three months advice, to change regulations for COVID and to um, change the habits to accept, for example, uh, they made a good in, uh, good change. Uh, it, this happened in several countries. They accepted the submission of invoices as an email attachment to the to designated people uh, within the Ministry of Finance under Accountant General's uh, unit. And those people accepted these invoices only from again designated officials of MDAs. At least they coordinated this effort so that they can at least move faster rather than going through the standard uh, complex process of handling the payments to, to, to cover the urgent needs, okay? But again, as soon as the crisis is over, they learned the lessons that what they were doing before was so um, and difficult to manage, so they will change the habits as soon as possible next year, and then start moving in the right direction. And so really, it's a mixture of uh, very good practices or very difficult cases, and you are right, you are perfectly right. It, 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 there's a huge risk of relaxing the controls, losing the oversight, and then not capturing the, for example, how to properly capture uh, expenditures through existing treasury systems. Mark nicely mentioned several options, okay? And many countries, somehow find a way in their own way. But uh, in the normal times, in one year time, I am sure they will think about uh, creating some cushion in their chart of account systems yeah. to address these emergencies. So I think this pandemic gave a lot of lessons to everyone. And I am hoping that next year when we organize a similar event, we will hear more uh, good stories, good practice cases uh, to learn from, and then hopefully uh, see uh, exactly. more examples in the field in the future. Thank that, you. That's a very good that's a very good conclusion, Jeff, because we lose connection in a minute. So <laughs> that's a perfect conclusion, and indeed. So don't don't lose any invoice in the meantime, uh, uh, even if it's outside of FMIS, uh, because the court of audit will will certainly come back and ask for it. So thank you very much for this rich uh, discussion and, and presentation. We'll share all the material. We can have follow up events and and chats. But for now, we'll just connect and uh, call this session closed and reconnect uh, under the BCOP uh, co uh, WebEx code for the wrap-up. So, so please uh, go back to the PDF. You'll see the BCOP WebEx for day two, and we'll all join there. And we'll call on, on a few countries to share their experiences, uh, so including uh, Solau has volunteered, 
Uh, we we also hope that Eduardo will volunteer uh, to share a few uh, takeaways uh, in Vietnam. Thank you, and uh, see you on the other side uh, in a minute.